Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, for inviting me here um, to, this, to, to give a lecture in this course, which I think is uh, wonderful. I was very excited when I heard when Cash told me about this uh, course. I was very excited to hear about it, and um, I'm actually thinking to uh, implementing this um, uh, course, this type of course, in, the, in my university. Uh, so I hope you are as excited as I am. Uh, and I will be talking about some uh, machine learning approaches um, that we use to analyze social networks in the context of disaster events. A little bit about me, um, a little more about me. So I work on um, machine learning for uh, big data, information retrieval and information extraction, uh, social network um, analysis and uh, opinion mining, sentiment and subjectivity analysis. Um, I have uh, many publications in uh, prestigious venues and I won uh, several uh, awards with uh, one of the with one of them being the most innovative application of uh, AI and um, also one of them uh, which won the third place in computer science at the Fort Worth uh, Regional Science and Engineering Fair and this was work done uh, with a, a high school student uh, which I was quite excited um, and it's on um, uh, extracting features uh, from disaster events to identify tweets that are informing, informative. Um, funding ag funding uh, agencies. Um, my research is funded mainly by uh, NSF, and it was also funded by Lockheed Martin. And this is actually how I got interested in uh, analyzing um, social media to help uh, with disaster management and recovery. And so the, the, my, my very first uh, grant, my, very, uh, my research was funded by uh, Lockheed Martin. Why social media? So um, we all use social networks um, and these social networks such as Facebook and Twitter uh, connect people all around the world in almost no time, virtually in almost, uh, in almost no time and have become part of our daily lives and our everyday communication patterns. Um, so last year in April um, 2017, there, Twitter um, announced that there were about 328 million uh, monthly active users. As the use of um, social media is on a rise, so is the use of social media in the context of disaster events. And there are many deadly disasters um, that are reported in the news today. And it feels like every, every week there is another disaster, like tornadoes, hurricanes, bombings, um, plane crashes, te terrorist attacks, and, and so on. So the disaster affected communities are increasingly becoming the source of big disaster data during and following major disasters. And here, just to give you um, an idea, so in the context uh, when the, the Sandy Hurricane happened in, 20, uh, in 2012, there were more than 20 million tweets posted during this, uh, at, during this event. And this is the tweet distribution um, by day during the, uh, the Sandy Hurricane uh, from a Twitter sam sample. A Twitter uh, uh, sample that we crawled um, during this event. So as you see, there is a peak here uh, on the 28th and 29 uh, October. And that was the time when Hurricane hit the East Coast. And as we can see here in our collection of tweets, uh, we had, during these days, more than 2 million uh, tweets per day. Similarly, when uh, the earthquake in Japan happened, there were more than 
uh, 5,000 tweets posted every second in Twitter. Um, and so this resulted in about 1.5 million tweets every five minutes. And this is the data flow. Here is where the, the earthquake happened. And the white edges are the tweets from Japan, and the blue ones are the global replies. So people all over the world reply and comment and uh, discuss about uh, the, the earthquake. So there, there were many, many, many million uh, tweets posted uh, during, the, during and following uh, the, the days of uh, the earthquake. And this is, these two are just um, two examples. But this is the case with almost all the disasters that happen, and particularly with major disasters. Researchers assert that uh, bystanders, people on the ground, are uniquely positioned to share information that may not be available el elsewhere in the information space. The information that is posted by the people on the ground, by people that participate around the disaster, the information that they post is very valuable and sometimes is, uh, produces results that are more accurate than the official communication. So we can see, like, if somebody is posting this, um, uh, this picture uh, in Twitter, it will give us an idea, wherever we are, it will give us an idea of what is the condition in this particular New York City subway uh, system which was flooded. Um, so the data, social media data, is seen as, are seen as ubiquitous, uh, rapid and accessible, will contribute to improving situational awareness, and uh, the information reaches a widespread audience in almost no time. Despite that social media data and the tweets, that the information that is posted it's very valuable. Still, disaster response organizations are not using fully the, the disinformation that is posted in social media. And there are several reasons. First, uh, response organizations operate in uh, conditions of extreme uncertainty due to res the reasons um, such as the sporadic nature of the disaster, um, as well as the unique characteristic of each disaster. And another reason is the exponential number of tweets that are posted, and many of these tweets being irrelevant. So these irrelevant tweets would diminish people's ability to find information that they need in order to organize relief efforts, find help, and potentially save lives. So what can, be, what can be a solution? To filter, to find information that is useful and filter out all the tweets that are not useful. One approach could be using uh, a keyword-based approach. So searching for just keywords. Say, Oklahoma tornado happened and we want to search for keywords like Oklahoma tornado, the combination, um, separately, in individually, Oklahoma and tornado, and then hashtag Oklahoma tornado. And another approach would be to look at the tweets that have geolocation in the area of Oklahoma. However, this will actually um, return a lot of irrelevant tweets. And an example here is, I lived in Oklahoma since um, I was born. So this really doesn't have anything to do with the Oklahoma, the a tornado that happened in Oklahoma. On the other hand, so um, a manual <coughs> selection of tweets is too time consuming. And hence, there is an increased need to automatically extract appropriate information, which could make uh, improvements in the uh, response process. So our questions are, in a social media stream of messages, what 
is the useful information that needs to be extracted that can help emergency response organizations as well as people on the ground to, be, to become more situationally aware during um, and following a disaster. And then what are the features and the models, the, the learning models, that can help us to automatically identify messages that are useful during a disaster. So we particularly try to find mechanisms, solutions, to automatically identify disaster-related tweets that are informative in nature and filter out those that are irrelevant, that are conversational in nature. And the, our definitions here for informative tweets are any tweets which would provide valuable, concrete information to anybody viewing that tweet, those tweets, and non-informative or conversational or irrelevant tweets have no concrete information. The information would not be universally useful within language barriers to anybody who could read the tweets. And here are some examples of informative or relevant, irrelevant tweets that were posted during two disasters, uh, the Sandy Hurricane and Alberta flooding. So a non-informative one is an example is, uh, this Hurricane Sandy Twitter is so annoying. And then an informative one says, more than this many homes in seven states have no elect electricity with New York and New Jersey being most affected. Seeing this information would increase our um, situational awareness. We'd, we would know what's going on on the ground. What is kind of the status of the disaster regarding the electricity in those states. And as another example here uh, from Alberta flooding, uh, a non-informative one is Shakespeare in the Park. And then an informative one would be here, insane photo of uh, flooded parking and Discovery Ridge via this global Calgary. And then there was a picture here with a tweet. So this, again, um, so we want to identify, extract the tweets that are informative in nature and filter out those that are not informative so that we help not only response organizations, but also the people on the ground who are looking for information and who want to see what is the status of the disaster. How is the disaster out there? And now we are going into the machine learning part. I will explain a few things of how uh, a machine learning algorithm would work, just uh, in case you, if you don't have uh, background on this, I will explain. But uh, feel free to ask me questions and um, if, you, if you have questions. So supervised learning show, shows promising results in analyzing uh, social networks, social media data in the context of disaster events with some previous works, including ours. So here I will describe two approaches. One is a supervised approach, supervised learning approach, um, I will discuss the features that we extracted and the learning algorithm that we use to automatically identify uh, informative tweets versus not informative tweets, um, as well as a domain adaptation approach, which is based on an iterative binary classification model that uses the expectation maximization algorithm to better handle future disasters. And we, I, I will explain um, why this two different approaches. So I will start with the supervised learning approach. In supervised learning, we have a training set, uh, the blue part. So this is the training set, which is labeled. So we have a tweet and it's, cut, it's class. It's informative or not informative. So we have a collection of tweets along with their class. And then we have tweets in the test set which are not labeled. So we don't know what their class is. So we represent each tweet as a vector of features and then predict a tweet as informative 
or belonging to the positive class, or not informative, or belonging to the negative class, and use the data to train a naive Bayes classifier. So we train the classifier on the label data, and then once we have the classifier, we use that one to assign labels to the unlabeled, to the test data. The naive Bayes classifier performs classification using the Bayes rule, uh, which is basically this here. I will explain it just a bit. And then it makes an independence assumption that the features, so as I said, each, each tweet is represented as a vector of features, and each feature in this vector is independent of each other given the class. And so given that the features are independent, that would allow us to factorize the joint probability and write it as product of local probabilities. So given a new instance, x, which is a vector of features, x1 through xn, the class that will be assigned by the naive Bayes classifier is Cx, which is the probability. So this is the argmax over the set of classes of probability of each class given that example, that tweet, x. And using the Bayes rule, we can rewrite this probability as the probability of the tweet given the class multiplied with the class divided by probability of x, probability of the tweet. And the argmax here will basically return the class. So let's say in our case we have two classes, plus one and minus one, informative, not informative. This argmax will return the class, either positive or negative, that will maximize this quantity, this probability. So if probability of the positive class, given the tweet, is greater than the probability of the negative class given the tweet, then the tweet will be assigned to the positive class. I will give an example on the next slides. This is um, a little bit high, high level, but I will give an example on the following slides. So because we make this assumption, a uh, naive assumption, that the features are independent given the class, then we can rewrite this probability of x of the tweet given the class as the product over i, with i going from 1 to n, the number of features, of probability of each feature given the class times probability of the class. And we don't use this probability of x because it does not depend on c, on the class c. Um, as argmax, as I said, will return the class that maximizes this quantity, this quantity. So training a naive Bayes classifier basically reduces to estimating um, these probabilities, probability of each class, CK, as well as probability of each feature given each class. And then testing the classifier involves predicting the most probable class for the in instance in the test set and basically calculating this quantity here. So let's look at an example to make things a little more concrete. So assume we have a training set with four examples. We have three attributes or features, size, color, and shape, and we have the class. So for the first example, uh, size has value small, color has value red, and then uh, shape is circle then given these features, these characteristics of this object, then we assign this object to the positive class. Um, similarly, if it's red, if it's large and red and circle, then we assign this to the positive class, and so on. So this is our training set, and as I said here, from the training set, training a naive Bayes classifier will reduce to estimating this 
probability of each class and probability of each feature or each attribute given each class. What is the probability, given that this is our training set, what is the probability of plus one of the class? Plus one. Half. Yeah, half. <laughs> Correct. So we have four examples in total and two from the positive class. So that would be two divided by four. Similarly, the probability of uh, the negative class is two divided by four. It's 0 0.5 for, for uh, both. What is now the probability of small given the positive class? So probability of small given C, uh, given plus one, sorry. Huh? Half, correct. So that would be 0 0.5. So we look at exa uh, the examples that belong to the positive class. We want probability of small given plus one, given that we are in the set of examples with plus one, we count how many times small appears, and that is one, one time, divided by the number of examples in this class. So that would be one divided by two examples in the positive class. Uh, very good. What is the probability of medium given the positive class? Zero. Very good. Any other? Like, let's do one more. Uh, probability of triangle given the negative class, one half. So probability of triangle given the negative, we have two examples in the negative class, and we have one instance with the value of shape being triangle. So we have one instance divided by two instances. So that's a half. So this is basically training a naive-based classifier. It's just estimating, ju estimating this probability of each class. We have, in our case here, we have two classes, probability of each class as well as probability of each feature given each class. Here you see we estimate probability of small given plus one, which is 0 0.5. Um, and then probability of small given minus one, which is, my, uh, so it's one divided by two examples in the negative class. So that is also 0 0.5. And we do, so we estimate all these parameters from the training set. And this is learning a naive base classifier. This is equivalent with learning a naive base classifier. And of course, we, do, uh, we, we will do um, a few other things like uh, smoothing so we avoid zero probabilities because if we look here at the product, if we multiply with a zero probability, then everything will become zero. And we, we add up one to each and we, we divide by an appropriate quantity so that we avoid zero probabilities. But to keep things simple, simple um, Estimate, uh, training a naive base classifier will reduce to estimating these probabilities. Probability of each class and probability of each feature given uh, each, each class. Now, at inference time, so we, we saw how we actually train a model. How do we do uh, inference? What is the class that we assign to a new test example? So given that we have, so this is our model, and you see here that I do not have zero probabilities for any, so this is a smooth probability. Now given a test instance, like medium, red, and circle, what is the class for, for this instance? How do we calculate the class for, it, for this instance? And as I um, showed here, the class that we will assign will basically be the art marks the, uh, the class that will maximize this probability. So we calculate probability of plus one given x, we calculate probability of minus one given x, and then we see which one is higher, and that is the class that will be assigned to that particular example. And now, how do we calculate this probability of plus one given x? This is 
our example, and probability of minus one given x. We look at our model that is trained here, and so probability of plus one given x based on this formula will basically be the product over the features. And in our case, we have three features. Probability of each feature given the class times probability of class. So we have probability of plus one times probability of medium. Uh, this, this is the value for the first feature, medium, given plus one, times probability of red, given plus one, times probability of circle, given plus one, divided by probability of x, but we don't uh, really care about probability of x because um, we, we want arc max. We want the class that maximizes um, this quantity, this quantity here. And similarly, we calculate probability of minus one given x, probability of the other class given uh, the example. Um, and um, we, we get, so this is uh, for the positive class, this is for the negative class, and hence we assign uh, the, the class that is assigned to this example is the positive class. So it's an info, in our case would be an informative, regardless of the toy example that I have here. Um, so this would be, the, uh, so this particular instance would belong to the positive class. Make sense? So what are the features in our case? We see in, we see in the um, toy example how we basically, we have a training set, we learn a model, we estimate the probabilities of each class and each feature given each class. Um, and now, uh, and then we, we saw how we actually make inference given test examples, how we assign a particular class to each test example. So let's see what are the features uh, that we use in our case for identifying informative tweets. And we designed several features. So we s looked, at the, uh, looked at the data and kind of see what would be some patterns, some characteristics of tweets that are informative. And we saw that if the, the presence of URLs, if the tweets would contain URLs, then the tweet generally is very, it's more likely to be informative than not informative. So we looked at emoticons, the presence or absence of uh, emoticons like this. And so this would mainly appear in the negative class. So if, it, if a tweet is generally informative, then it will be a little more formal, more like the style, the writing style, everything is a little more formal than um, with the non-informative, irrelevant, conversational type of tweets. We also extracted another feature, uh, which is uh, the presence or absence of the retweet, if the tweet is a retweet or not. The more retweets a tweet has, the more likely that tweet will contain some type of information that is useful uh, either for the people on the ground or for emergency response organizations. We also extracted instructional keywords, like the presence or absence of uh, keywords such as text or call or donate. This would basically provide some information, uh, like a phone number, call this number to donate. So that would contain some piece of information that may be relevant uh, to uh, some people. The presence or absence of phone numbers uh, internet slang, um, abbreviations like LOL. We put together, we created a dictionary of this type of words from the internet. Profanity, words, the presence or absence of such words. And then the six sentence structure um, analysis, we used the open NLP parser to check for sentence structure. Later, like more recently, we actually looked at the Twitter account that also gave some information. For example, if the account was verified, th those type of, types of features that would be 
informative, this would provide discriminative features for the task of identifying informational tweets. In, in machine learning, um, a part of an NLP community, of a part of research is um, on feature design. Um, and I would say less and less now because of the deep learning part and how many of you have heard about deep learning? Okay, so deep learning is a kind of technique that you give the text to the, to the algorithm and will basically extract the features for you. So it's instead of taking a long time to, to design and handcraft features, the algorithm will do it for you. It, in some cases, when we combine actually deep learning with these types of features, the performance of models increased. And we have, um, we actually uh, got a paper accepted on uh, using some combination of this type of features, manually um, extracted, handcrafted features with deep learning techniques and the performance was uh, higher than uh, using uh, either deep learning or these features independently. All right, um, to evaluate our proposed features, we manually labeled a subset of tweets <coughs> that were posted during the uh, Hurricane Sandy. We crawled these 12, almost 13 million tweets and manually labeled a subset of tweets, uh, about 1,100 tweets that were labeled as informative or not informative. And our experiments were organized around the following questions. How do models trained using the proposed features, the features that I just showed you on the previous slide, would compare with the bag of words based features or model? So the bag of words will just use just the words from the tweet and not necessarily make the model pay attention to features like phone numbers or instructional keywords. So it's just the content based on the words that appear in the tweet with no necessarily no emphasis on uh, these particular features. Um, can the combination of our proposed features with a bag of words would improve the performance further? And then what are the most discriminative? What are the features that will um, um, have the, the highest discriminative power for, the, um, for our task? And as evaluation measures, we use precision, recall, and F1 score, which were, op were obtained in tenfold cross-validation experiments using this naive base model. So the tenfold cross-validation is basically from the entire data set, and in our case, 11, uh, 1,100 tweets, labeled tweets, we divided this set in 10 all, uh, roughly equal parts, and nine parts were used for training, and one part was used for testing, and we repeated this process 10 times with each fold, each subset, being a test, and then the, the remaining nine ones being used as train. So this was done um, to, uh, to, to determine the statistical significance of our results. To, to repeat the same experiment multiple times with uh, different samples from the data as train and test. Um, precision and recall are widely used in information uh, retrieval and natural language processing uh, as measures for evaluation. And precision would give us from all the examples that are classified, let's say we look at the positive class. From all the examples that I are classified as positive by the classifier, how many of them are indeed correct? So the classifier will make mistakes, so will classify as positive some subset. But from this subset that is classified as positive by the classifier, how many of them are correct? Um, and the recall is um, slightly different. So um, from all 
the examples that are positive, how many of them were correctly identified by the model. And the F1 score is just the harmonic mean between the precision and recall. Um, and here are the results uh, for, for each class, for informative and not informative, uh, using the proposed features, using the bag of words and the combination. So generally the combination performed best. We have very good performance on the non-informative class and um, fairly good performance on the informational class, but that uh, definitely can be improved. As some of the most discriminative features for extracting informative tweets, we use the information gain. This is a um, measure for ranking features. The presence of URLs w was basically the, the most informative feature uh, for this task. And then emoticons and instructional words and so on. So this is the ranking of features. And this is the work that uh, we won the third place in computer science with, uh, with two high school students. Um, one, actually, who joined later, and uh, another one who was instrumental of this work, of implementing and extracting the features and uh, uh, running the, learning the models and everything. We have good results, promising results for identifying informational tweets. The problem is when a disaster happens, it happens quickly, people start tweeting, we do not have time to label data. Labeling takes a long time. Labeling, so if we spend time to, to label the data, we will delay days. And how can we help in the context when a, when a disaster just starts to unfold, how can we quickly help to automatically um, filter out irrelevant tweets, informative tweets, uh, non-informative non tweets, and keep only those that are informative? So we propose to use a domain adaptation approach, an iterative binary classification model, which uses uh, the expectation maximization to better handle future disasters. So the idea would be roughly, and I'll go into details uh, later, to use label data from a previous disaster and then a previous, which we call source disaster, and train a model there, and then use the data for the target and un or target unlabeled or disasters that just happens together with data from the unlabeled disaster that just uh, happened uh, to train a naive base uh, classifier. So how does this? So we estimate first a classifier on the source. So let's say there was the Oklahoma tornado and then let's take the other example like Harvey Hurricane a difference of quite a few years. So we use the Oklahoma tornado to, as a source disaster. We train an initial classifier here, and then we use this classifier. So this would be the parameters. This is the model. This, these are the model parameters. This is our naive base classifier that is just trained on the source domain. And then we use this classifier to label a part of the unlabeled data that, is, that people start tweeting, the tweets that are becoming available. We use this classifier here to label this part. And then we put together this, the source, and now Initially, the target was unlabeled, but now we have this part which is labeled with our source classifier. We put to everything together, and then we retrain. We retrain another model, and then we 
more and more tweets are becoming available, we again label more tweets. We repeat this process. We label, retrain, relabel, retrain, and so on. We iteratively repeat this process until there will be no more changes in the labels from the target domain. And then we use the final classifier to assign labels to the test target tweets. So here we calculate the probability of the class given the each tweet. And this would be the probability of the class multiplied with the product over all the features. Probability of WI, the feature, given each class. So this is all good. Sometimes, though, we may introduce noise. So the model, the model that we train here and we use to, lay, to assign labels to the target disaster might actually, in, at least in the beginning, when we don't have, uh, in the beginning, when we don't have a lot of data from the target disaster, might actually perform not very good as we would like add more and more um, data and we have more data from, from the target disaster. So another like solution would be to be very cautious on the tweets that we add to the label, to, to the label set when we retrain the model. So instead of adding all the tweets that we label, so here we train the classifier here, we label all this part and we put together everything. All the tweets that are labeled here, we combine them with this and we retrain the model. But instead of doing this, we will keep only very few tweets that are classified with very high confidence belonging to a particular class, and then we retrain. So let's say we, can, we may add only five tweets or 10 tweets, depending on experimentation. K tweets that will be classified in those classes with very, very high probability. With very, the probability of the class, given that particular tweet, would be above some threshold, for example, 0 0.95. So if that probability is above this threshold, then we add the example to the, to the label set and we retrain. Otherwise, we don't add because it may happen that we just add noise to, to the model. <coughs> so the, the second idea, so the first idea is to use the uh, expectation maximization. So this is EM, the EM algorithm. The second idea is to use the self-training. So uh, in the self-training, we have, um, so we train an initial classifier. Um, we have the uh, label set and unlabeled data. We, tr we learn a classifier on the label set. And then we use that classifier, apply this classifier F on the unlabeled data, and um, the k examples with mo most confident predictions, the, the examples with the highest uh, confidence, predicted with the highest confidence, will be moved from the unlabeled to the labeled set. And then we, so the, augment, the L set, the labeled set, will be augmented with these k examples only K examples, not everything, from the unlabeled set. Um, and then we repeat, uh, we retrain the model, we label the unlabeled data, we again find the top K highest, the, the tweets that are predicted with the highest confidence and uh, repeat. So it's basically train, predict, retrain, uh, using own predictions and then repeat. 
So we repeat this process uh, several times. So we experimented with both uh, expectation maximization and self-training, um, and we'll see uh, what the <coughs> results are. So here, our research questions were, why knife base? There are so many classifiers. There are, I recently read um, an article um, which were kind of looking at the number of machine learning algorithms versus the number of parameters that each algorithm would come with, and it's like estimating, and why from like all this ab ab about 40 learning algorithms and variations, maybe definitely more, variations are way more. <laughs> why knife base? So we compare the supervised knife base classifier with other uh, supervised classifiers to answer this question. And so we, we'll see the results in just a bit. And then we wanted to see if the domain adaptation approach would help. And we compare the supervised naive base with uh, the domain adaptation naive base that uses both EM and self-training. And we also wanted to see how much labeled source data would be needed for accurate target classification. And we varied the number of source label data and observed the recorded the performance on the target. We actually had another question, which I didn't um, add here, because it adds, it, it needs a little more um, attention. We have some preliminary results. The question would be, if we put together data from multiple sources, so let's say we have a repository of disasters and label data, and the disaster that just happens, would it help if we actually use data from multiple sources versus from one single source? And what type of disaster would help, let's say if we have a hurricane that just happens, would it help if we use data from a hurricane to predict hurricane? Or is it better to use tornado for hurricane? Or if we put together hurricane and tornado, what happens? So we are in the process of experimenting um, and uh, evaluating this uh, question as well. All right, for the data sets, um, we used uh, six disaster data sets, which are available are available from Crisis Lex, T6. This is, this is a group from Qatar who developed uh, Crisis Lex. They do have, if you are interested, they do have another collection with 26 disasters, all labeled. On these ones, each disaster, each of the six, uh, have roughly 8,000 to 9,000 examples. In the T26, crisis like T26, each disaster will have about 1,000 uh, labeled tweets. So there are about 26,000 labeled tweets in that collection. So we looked at Sandy Hurricane, Queensland flooding, Boston bombing, West Texas explosion, Oklahoma tornado, and Alberta flooding. So this is, this is the notation that I will use on the following slides. These are the number of tweets on topic, off topic, relevant, irrelevant to the disaster. And then this is the total number of tweets. Um, here we use the um, five-fold cross-validation over the target um, and report the AUC, the uh, area under the ROC curve. So basically the, the closer to one, the higher the performance. So we, are, uh, we want to see numbers, zero point something, that are closer to one. And so what I mean by five-fold cross-validation over the target, so uh, remember that before I said we had this uh, 1,100 tweets. We divided that set in 10 parts, and we used one part for testing and the remaining nine, nine parts for training. And we repeated this process 10 times with each subset becoming test at one step. Here, we do this five-fold cross-validation over the target. So we, 
Now we have the target, the, the disaster. We divide the disaster, the tweets in the target in five roughly equal subsets. And then we use the source entirely for each experiment. So we train on the source, and then we use from the target four folds are used as unlabeled data, and one fold is used as test, just to clarify here a little bit. So this is our target. We divide this, say, into five roughly equal subsets. This would be our unlabeled data that we use to, to put together to retrain the model at each iteration. And one part, say a part from here, would be kept aside, will not take part in the training process. Will be kept aside so that we do the testing on. So, and here are the disaster spares. So we trained on Sandy Hurricane, we tested on Queensland flooding trained on Sandy Hurricane, tested on Boston bombings, and so on. And the, uh, the way we decided on these disaster pairs was based on their chronological happening in time. Uh, so if a disaster happened in 2013, that could have been target for a disaster that happened in 2012, and the 2012 disaster could not have been a target for a disaster that happened later. So why the naive base? Why we decided to use the naive base classifier? We compared it with SVM, which is another very powerful classifier, learning classifier, widely used in machine learning. Random forest, which is an ensemble of um, trees of another type of learning model putting together multiple learning models, an ensemble of learning models, which is very powerful in machine learning. Many, so it performs quite well on many machine learning tasks. And the logistic regression model, which is yet another one, which is quite, uh, quite uh, powerful. The naive base classifier generally performed best, but it was very competitive. Uh, the, the random forest was very competitive as well. So um, we could have used both. However, we decided to, because of its simplicity and because it was performing similarly with the random forest, we decided to use the naive base uh, classifier. Uh, the, its simplicity, I'm, I'm coming back to this issue, um, in the naive base model, we generally don't have hyperparameters to train, to, to uh, sorry, to estimate. In the random forest, we need to estimate the number of trees. So this is a tree, tree <coughs> based model, kind of a put, a, put together a collection of uh, decision uh, tree learning models. How many trees should we put in this? Uh, random forest in this ensemble to make, uh, to make the learning um, better. So it's a question, it's yet another parameter that we, need, we would need to estimate. So because of their similar performance, we decided to use the naive base and understand how, if actually um, the domain adaptation type of approach would actually help versus um, instead of trying to estimate uh, parameters for the model. For the second question, if the naive base with domain adaptation would help, we compare the naive base with, in the supervised case with the naive base with EM, the expectation maximization algorithm, and with the naive base with self-training. And generally, this the naive base model with self-training 
perform better than the naive base with the EM, and as we expected, because we are generally more careful of the type of tweets that we add to the to the label set bef um, before we retrain the model, and both of them actually outperform um, the naive base in the supervised case, and then. We experimented with the amount of source data that we used. So we wanted to see if we would use the entire, the entire collection. So for, for Sandy Hurricane, we, would have, we have roughly about 9,000 tweets in our source, in our data. Um, and what if we would actually use less number of tweets? What would be the performance? So we trained the model w on um, um, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, and all of them. So the source, so instead of using the entire source data set, we would use only um, fractions to see if the performance, how the performance would actually vary. Because first of all, we do store the model. And once a disaster happens, we will use the model that is stored, that is saved. But it might be the case that we may want to do some training when the disaster happens and use data from multiple sources. So. So here, as we can see, if we use about uh, 4,000 tweets, generally from each disaster, like from all the, on all the experiments that we, we did, versus if we use all, the performance is very similar. So in summary, uh, developments in extracting appropriate relevant information during disaster events are central to disaster management and response. We proposed supervised and domain adaptation models for the extraction of relevant and informative tweets. Uh, we found that the domain adaptation is helpful in improving classification performance as compared to the supervised learning. And large amounts of label source data, for example, 4,000 instances, result in better performance over if we would use only 500, 500 examples. So for example, here it increases from 0.94 to 0.97. And again, this is AUC. And then we recently started using the deep learning and particularly used the convolutional neural networks. Also combine these uh, CNNs, the convolutional neural networks, with features that we designed that the features that I showed you are a subset. We extracted features from the author account and so on. Um, and we have some success there as well. And as future directions, we plan to identify those tweets that contain not only information, but some that requires some action, to, to some action to be taken. So for example, if somebody is tweeting that uh, he or she is under some, some building at some address, then that tweet requires an action from the response organizations to go and save those people. Or if somebody would need water, drinking water, that also requires an a some action to, to go and deliver water to those people. And then understanding how quickly the, the networks can recover. These are some of the publications um, that I use throughout the talk.